Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And this is 2014. It's the 50th anniversary year of Rachel Carson's death. Uh, and to commemorate that and to uh, remember Carson, we actually have three uh, Carson aficionados and experts with us today. And we're going to talk a little about Carson's legacy, uh, both her history and, and carrying that legacy forward. So we're very fortunate to have three guests. Thank you all for coming here today. And let me introduce you. Uh, to my right is Patricia DeMarco. She was trained as a biologist. She has a doctorate from the University of Pittsburgh and postdoctoral appointments at Yale and Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, her original research focused on environmental mutagens and mutation mechanisms. She's worked in the field of energy and environmental policy since 1975. She's been a Rachel Carson Scholar since 2005. Uh, she served as the executive director of the Rachel Carson Homestead Association, which is where I first met yes. Patricia. Uh, and then she was director of the Rachel Carson Institute at Chatham University. She's a senior scholar at Chatham University and holds an appointment as a visiting researcher and writer at Carnegie Mellon University's Institute of Green Sciences. She's currently writing a book entitled Pathways to Our Sustainable Future and Environmental Ethic for the 21st Century. We'll probably talk about that a little awesome. later in the program. Next to her is Mark Dixon, and he graduated from Stanford University in 1997 with a degree in industrial engineering. He started his technology career in Silicon Valley, but his evidence for global warming and resource depletion uh, increased. Mark decided to refocus his life on tackling those issues, launching an award-winning documentary, Yurt, Your Environmental Road Trip, in 2006 with a college buddy, Ben Evans. That's where I first met Mark, was through that film at our film festival. He kindly enough agreed to show it here. He's currently working on several new film projects, spanning solar roadways, the Green Building Alliance, and Schwartz's Living Market. He's a board member of the Thomas Merton uh, Center and Ooh. Communitopia, and he's premiering, I think it might be a world premiere tonight. Yes. It <laughs> is, His Definitely. brand new film, yep. uh, The Power of One, A 50-Year Perspective on the Life of Rachel Carson. It's so new, I just saw the cover, um, which is beautiful, and uh, we're very excited to have the premiere out here at NCTC, uh, a place where we take Carson's legacy very seriously. Yep. Uh, and, and then, Next to Mark is the person at the table I've known the longest, Linda <laughs> Lear, uh, is the biographer of Rachel Carson. She mm -hmm. is an environmental historian and a very accomplished biographer. She holds her PhD in history from George Washington University. After a career as a research professor in environmental history at GW and UMBC, Lear was awarded a Beinecke Fellowship at Yale University and there served as a senior fellow later at the Smithsonian Institution for eight years. She's been writing biography full-time since 1997 when she published uh, really the first, uh, I think, academic and comprehensive biography of Rachel Carson called Rachel Carson, Witness for Nature. It was awarded the prize for the best book on women in science by the History of Science Society. I remember when it came yeah. out, I was very active uh, in HSS and it created quite a stir. It was so impressive. It's been translated into 14 languages. Uh, she's also uh, in 1988 edited Lost Woods, The Discovered Writing of Rachel Carson, which is an eye-opener to a number of us. Mm -hmm. And she wrote an introduction to the 40th and 50th anniversary editions of Silent Spring. Then in 2007, uh, Linda published a biography of the famous artist and children's writer Beatrix Potter called A Life in Nature. It, too, was awarded a number of prizes in the U.S. and U.K. Beautiful book that helped uh, introduce all of us to the, the natural history that Beatrix Potter did that was largely unwritten she was about amazing. before this. Mm -hmm. She was extraordinary. That's another show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lear was awarded an honorary doctorate in humane letters by Chatham University in 2008 for her work on women and the environment. She served for 10 years on the board of trustees at her alma mater, Connecticut College. In 2011, this is really exciting to me, not only was she a biographer and a historian, but then in 2011, Linda established the Linda Lear Center for Special Collections and Archives, where her papers on Carson and Potter are open for research. So uh, not only have you written 
uh, wonderful biographies, but you've made it possible for other people to study these folks. Uh, we it's hope. the greatest mm -hmm. uh, contribution possible. Uh, today, she's a regular contributor to Nature Magazine and maintains a very active lecture schedule in this country and abroad. We are very fortunate to get her to come all the way out here just uh, to tape this broadcast. So we're, we're most Happy appreciative for all three of you to be here. I have three Carson experts. Um, and uh, let me jump off uh, in that this year, earlier this year, uh, Linda, you wrote a, a, a fascinating editorial for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette um, talking about some of the things uh, that Rachel Carson left unsaid and some of the things we might not have known about her. Why don't you tell yeah. us a little about that? Well, the idea was to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Carson's death um, and not just her writings and to give her credit for some of the things that privately Rachel Carson had done that the public didn't know very much about. And they couldn't know very much about it. Not not just because she was a private person, but because Silent Spring was such a blockbuster, such a powerful changing uh, in the way in the way science was dealt to the public, that she didn't dare um, in the controversy talk about some of the other things that were very dear to her heart. Um, one of which was the humane treatment of animals. Um, she was on the American, American well, Animal Welfare League. She was very active in uh, legislation, as active as she could be, kind of sub rosa, um, uh, to prevent trapping of wild animals and, and humane traps. She was against um, abattoirs and wrote about that for an English book but couldn't write about it in the United States. And she was also, um, I think, very interested in the Rodale movement and in the, in the farming and in organic foods. She couldn't do all these things because the controversy of Silent Spring was so intense and she was uh, labeled as such a kook, such a crazy woman, um, spinster of nature, all these miserable appellates, that she, she um, couldn't associate herself with something else that was controversial or it would have lessened the uh, lessened the impact of her book. That's great. And, and all of this was new, especially the connection to Rodale and the organic farm movement. Right. Um, how, did, did she meet Jerome Rodale or? Uh, I don't think so, but um, through some of her friends, especially in the Long Island group, she, uh, she, she began to eat organically herself, <laughs> partly because she was ill by that time, but also because she was interested and she thought uh, knowing what she did about pesticides, that this was clearly the way to go. It makes you wonder what type of book she would have written had she Next. had she lived longer. Mm -hmm. She thought she wanted to write about evolution. I yeah, sort of really. doubt that she would ever have written this big book of evolution that she thought she'd write. Um, I think she would have done something more on, on organic foods or on contemporary issues. I don't think she would have gone back. Actually, that reminds me of one thing, we, this, this table is not cluttered because we're messy historians <laughs> and filmmakers and so on. Uh, we pulled out a few artifacts we have here in the archives, things that, that reflect her life, primarily um, some of her career uh, during the year she worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service, roughly from 1936 to 1952. Um, and we have everything from Rachel Carson's magnifying glass to a, a early edition of Silent Spring, some publications she did, including press releases. But one of the things we have Fish and Wildlife had nothing to do with, um, but this is kind of fun. This is uh, the Women's Home Companion, and in here there's an article by Carson, Help Your Child to Wonder, so this came out in 1956. And what uh, Linda's comments reminded me, um, Carson's Sense of Wonder book was published posthumously, right. correct? And uh, one of the ways she was pretty visionary, and I think people perhaps have forgotten to a certain extent, uh, was uh, her concern about introducing children to nature, to nature. Uh, primarily uh, through first-hand experiences with uh, Roger Christie, who was her adopted nephew, her adopted nephew, uh, who actually appears extensively in, in Mark's film. Yeah. Uh, but why don't you, Linda, tell us a little about um, her well, interest in this issue? Because well, I think I think just like the issues you talked about, it's something right. that's forgotten about. Now, Ra Rachel uh, thought as a person who loved nature so much herself and would go out into the tide pools and gently take things out and bring them home to, to Roger to look at and then go and put them back um, when she was living in Maine at exactly where she found them. Um, she was interested in 
birds in particular and birding life. All those things were things she introduced to children. So she wrote this article, Help Your, Help Your Child to Wonder, yeah, uh, Women's Home Companion. And it was published, and um, I don't remember that it caused great waves of interest, but it was certainly out there. And then um, she wanted to make it into a book herself uh, and hoped to do that. And after her death, it was done, and it came out as a sense of wonder. It's kind of interesting because 40 years later or so, Richard Louv came out with a book called mm -hmm. uh, Last Child Last in the Child Woods, Woods, which a fair number of the arguments had already come up uh, in 1957, <laughs> almost 50 years earlier in, in and Carson. It, and, it was, and, and it was really about how parents can be involved with their children in, in nature, and that it's a responsibility to do that. Great. Let's, let me move on to just a few more artifacts, and I'm going to yes. sweep them off the table. <laughs> <laughs> Gently, but there, there's some fun ones. Uh, one of the things she did when she worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service was she wrote a series of pamphlets with a great title, I, I want, a title I wish we'd revive called Conservation in Action. They're really yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and she went to a number of, of refuges uh, and wrote about them, including Chincoteague. And we actually have a, a typewriter from Chincoteague uh, that legend has it. Carson used when she visited. We have no way of substantiating it, nor shall we put Linda on the spot <laughs> uh, for something like that. But it's, it's from the vintage era, and these were the type of typewriters we used when Carson worked for us. Uh, but she traveled around to these uh, refuges to try to explain to the American public really what conservation was. It was a term that had been around a long time, um, but it was clear that uh, it, was, it was not uh, perfectly understood. Uh, and now, Patricia DeMarco, who's sitting next to me, actually went back to some of these refugees mm -hmm. and uh, is working on a book um, looking at Carson's legacy. So why don't you tell right. us a little about that? Well, I really felt that the issues that we're facing today are quite urgent in need of attention, but they're not technical problems. And we tend to think of them as though they were technical problems. And the discussions are always, well, when technology emerges, we'll solve this. But really, it's the decision and the value judgment that you value the natural world over the artifacts and the technologies to manipulate the natural world. And that was Rachel Carson's message from the very beginning. You know, to live in harmony with nature, to preserve and learn from the natural systems. And even from the sense of wonder, from the time you're a child, if you're taught to love the earth, you will not destroy it. And that principle of hers, of taking precaution and protecting the natural world and trying to understand its intricacies, which we just skirt around the edges. We're not really anywhere near understanding the true complexity of the natural world as it stands. I think her message today is even more compelling and more relevant than it was even when she wrote Silent Spring, because there's so much more evidence of the damage that we have done by not heeding the natural law. Very good. You also worked for many years at the Rachel Carson Homestead. I did. Uh, <laughs> and, and tell us a little about uh, where Carson grew up and, and well, what that was like. Springdale in, in the Allegheny River edge is still a pretty gritty town. Mm -hmm. There's a power plant right with the smokestack on a level with the house, and it has still operated burning coal. Uh, there were two of those in town when she lived there, as well as a glue factory just s slightly up the river. And she saw that town that was, when she was a very small child, still pretty rural, become part of the industrialization of Pittsburgh that went on during her lifetime while she lived there. And by the time she finished college, it was a gritty, dirty, you know, town where the lights were on at midday because it was so dark from the smoke. And I remember that growing up in Pittsburgh, you know, having the cinders coming down on your head and the laundry hung under the porch so that it didn't get black when you <laughs> dried the clothes. But Springdale was, is still kind of a, um, well, PPG has a production plant there and it has a power plant in operation. The people there are very much considering themselves part of the production system. They resent Rachel Carson in some ways as she killed the steel industry. And I had a lot of public relations issues to deal with when we were working at the homestead. But we did finally get the people of Springdale now consider it the place where Green was born. 
and they have the Springdale team of active re residents that work on representing her legacy. And we did the sustainable feast uh, on her birthday, which was usually Memorial Day weekend, and shut down the whole block for the whole day and had a thousand people or more cool. come there in order to participate in the festival. And I think the town came to recognize that she really was their, you know, hero yeah. in many ways. So it was a nice evolution to see, and um, I know they're continuing the restoration of the house now. Great. And in front of you, we actually yeah. have something from that era, and, yeah. and this this actually applies to two of the participants, yeah. <laughs> the panel here. It's something Carson wrote when she was 14. Yeah. In a St. Nicholas magazine, which my understanding was this was a magazine for children, yes. sometimes with contributions by young people. Right. Always, always by always by young always people. Always by always. Yeah, yeah, young yeah. people. And it was a children's magazine by children for children. And the the story she wrote in there was called My Recre My Favorite Recreation, and uh, we talk about this in the film even because it describes her activity on a day with her dog and her camera walking into the woods and following birds to their nests and taking pictures. Now, I've often wondered what became of those pictures because mm -hmm. she talks about them. Yeah. And we know she took pictures, but I don't know what became of them in, in later years. I don't know if we can see this. But she had, I think, an awareness and a sense of being attuned to nature that children today very rarely have a chance to develop. But to be given the opportunity to roam you know, 65 acres of what was still semi-rural area um, where cows were still wading in the river until the Cheswick Dam was built. She had, I think, a very, you know, wonderful way to grow up. Um, and I think today the lesson that we can take from that is that you need to have a connection to the natural world in order to really develop your own sense of humanity and our life support system we share with the whole interconnected web of life and if we don't preserve that we really end up damaging ourselves this uh particular article is in uh lost woods if i'm not yes, mistaken it is. It is. and uh it's pretty amazing linda correct me if i'm wrong but rachel started writing at Ten. At ten. <laughs> Publishing at ten. Yeah. And she you probably she have, always wanted to be a writer. Yeah, and you've collected her writings. What, I have. What, why is her style so effective, do you think? Well, it's simple in a in a sense. Um, it's very vivid. Mm -hmm. um, when Carson talks about the ocean, for example, she talks about the foam in the in the waves. She talks about particle things as well as big things, so that it's a it's a connection with nature that you can only make if you've been out in it and if you've looked at it hard, not just under the microscope, but just just hard. I think uh, one of the things that I find in her writings, not just in Lost Woods, but in her writings as a whole, is uh, it was not unusual that Rachel got interested in the ocean and that she came to public notice because of her three books on the sea, and that the writing about the sea was what really put Carson on the literary map. Um, she was the first one, I call her a public scientist for, for the public, for nature, yeah. because she, she wasn't writing for the academic world. She was writing for John Q. Public to tell them mm -hmm. what went on under the sea, what was it like to look up. And so she went um, um, scuba diving herself in one of those great big metal helmets yes. of the olden days. Um, unfortunately, the day that she went out um, she got tangled in um, seaweed and stuff, yeah. and all she could see above her head was some bubbles. But at least she got the feeling of what yeah. it must be like to be under the sea. Um, and that kind of vividness she conveyed in her writing to what she saw. We actually have one of her sea books we underneath do. Uh, we do. Witness for Nature. We have Under the Sea Wind, mm -hmm. uh, which, which was, was her first. first. Right. Uh, unfortunately, came out right before World War II. It came out right <laughs> just before Pearl, Pearl Harbor, Harbor mm -hmm. uh, which hurt sales probably yes. a little bit. And then she wrote uh, two more: The Sea Around the Us, Sea Around Us, and The Edge of the Sea. Both of which I strongly recommend. I mean, yeah, a lot oh, of people absolutely. read Silent Spring, but um, I, I, mm. especially the The Sea Around Us yes. is, is a it's striking still, book, a, a really mm -hmm. different perspective on our place right. um, in, nature. in nature. And it's still so relevant. I mean, her chapter, one chapter, starts. We live in a time of rising seas, 
Yes. And she explains why and how in the geologic history of the ocean, the course of the formation of the oceans, the formation of waves. So you really understand that we are creatures that are associated with the water as part of our evolution, as part of our life. And in ways that, I mean, I read it when I was on the boat coming back from Brazil to Pittsburgh. It was in the ship library. <laughs> and this was a few years after it came out, maybe two years after it came out. And I was just fascinated because I'm on the ocean and having a chance to read about it right there. And she went out with Scripps Oceanic Institute to go out in the sea to see it again after she'd written the, uh, the Edge of the Sea and the Sea Around Us. Um, she was always interested in the sea. And I, I did make the point, and I still believe it, um, when people ask me, why did Carson love the sea so much? Why was she interested in the sea? From the porch of that little house mm -hmm. in Springdale, she could look out on the Allegheny River, and it was a very wide area of the Allegheny that in that era, mm -hmm. and she and her brothers and sisters would go down there and could swim and could pick things up and look at things. Um, and I, I don't think it was that suddenly she went to Woods Hole and saw the sea and said, oh, I've got to write about this. I think she was interested in water mm -hmm. and the sea and uh, geology yeah. and the formation of the sea and what it had done from the get-go. Well, we've had such a good time with <laughs> Patricia and Linda. We've left Mark yeah, out of right. the talk, but Mark, that's all right. I, you, I haven't spent a lifetime studying her. I'm just, <laughs> just a couple of years. Just now. feels like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like it. <laughs> well, uh, your interest in Carson actually goes back uh, to your earlier film, Yurt. Tell us uh, how that tied into the, the homestead. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, we um, we launched the film in 2007, actually, as a road trip. Okay. And I think that was the I mean, was that the hundredth year anniversary yep. of her Absolutely. birth, so, yep. her um, birthday. which which we didn't realize until we got close to the start date of this trip. And and that road trip was called Yurt, Your Environmental Road Trip. It was a 50-state adventure over the course of one year, talking to people of all stripes and creeds and colors about environmental issues all around the country. Um, and I learned so much about it. And um, and we made a point, you know, we were thinking of starting the road trip in either New York or San Francisco because they're on the edge of the, of the country right. and then we can just crisscross in between. But um, I moved to Pittsburgh to live with my sister while I prepared to start the film um, and Ben Evans moved there as well to help get things going and we realized there was such an incredible environmental community right in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and there was Rachel Carson this gem of the environmental movement how could we <laughs> Ready not <made. laughs> right how could we not it was our destiny to start Started the road trip at, the, at right. the Rachel Carson homestead and the 100th year anniversary of her birth um, not to the day but to the year and um, and as we were leaving we were trying to think well what do we nickname this this vehicle that we're driving across the country it was a little Ford Escape hybrid that we had bought used for the journey we decided to nickname it Rachel the car Carson and I swear it felt like she was our guardian angel over the course of that trip. There were times where we just, it was small miracles would happen and we, you know, you never know, but we certainly, um, we didn't slow ourselves down from, from attributing it entirely to Rachel Carson. And what did Rachel the car Carson do today? <laughs> oh, you know, well, she drove us here. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. She's an honored guest at NCTC, <laughs> yep. so we're, we're very excited to have her here. Yep. And parked in a low emission spot as well. <laughs> yes, that's what we have designated. Perfect. Yes. So, what made you decide to uh, make a film about Carson? Mm. It's been a long time, uh, at least a decade, since we've had a, a, a film that I know of on, on Carson. Uh, what, what possessed you? Yeah, um, I would say Patty possessed me. Um, <laughs> okay. Patty and I had been working together and, and on and off and knowing each other. You know, we've, we started the road trip at the Rachel Carson Homestead and we ended the trip with an event at the Rachel Carson Homestead. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we premiered the film in Pittsburgh at the um, at Chatham University where Rachel mm -hmm. Carson went to school and um, so Patty and I had been in communication for years and and it Patty was working on a conference to bring together people to celebrate the 50 year anniversary of Silent Springs yeah. release and um, she knew me as a filmmaker and thought oh it would be such a horrible opportunity to miss if we didn't if we didn't um, capture this moment and all these amazing people with such a breadth of knowledge about Rachel Carson's life if we didn't capture them and I thought that was a great idea mm -hmm. and so we gathered together with Patty and and also Steeltown Entertainment Project in Pittsburgh and they assembled a little funding that helped us bring a crew in and and document the the event that day and do a number of, of private interviews with people um, including 
you know, Roger and and Linda and and uh, a number of others, and of course you, <laughs> no, a number of others, now. including yeah, yourself, an anchor, an anchor, an <laughs> anchor of the film, if <laughs> I can say. Um, and uh, and then we spent the next two years, basically threading, threading, the story of how to tell the story of a fifty-year retrospective, mm -hmm. um, one that would be interesting to modern audiences, but do justice to the truth and and the essence of what Rachel Carson has contributed in the time when she was alive and then in the time since, but also trying to make it more relevant um, in the modern time by looking at what, what we learned and what we haven't learned yeah. yet mm -hmm. from, the, from, from the example of Rachel Carson in her book. It's a very good film. It could not be hotter off the press. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, just, yes. it just, just literally right is, you know, just very recently uh, been completed. And uh, Mark has, has very generously um, agreed to share the film with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service folks. So if people mm -hmm. uh, want to see the film, uh, it actually already uh, is is up on Vimeo with a with a, a link. And uh, if you want to uh, send me an email, if you're a service employee, we would be happy to share that film with you, which is a, a really nice legacy, and it's much appreciated, Mark, mm -hmm. for um, covering somebody who spent a long time communicating both externally with the American public, but also within her own agency desperately trying to get them to do the right thing. Sometimes they listened, um, sometimes they didn't, or it took them a couple decades to, to get it right. Uh, that's much appreciated, so thank you. You're very welcome. I feel like in many ways we're all working in service of a common cause, Rachel Carson included, and so it, it feels like it's just sharing it with family. <laughs> Good. Well, we've talked about some of the things people didn't know about Carson, but I think the thing that's most familiar about Carson um, is her book Silent Spring and DDT, and of course we brought a first edition of Silent Spring. This is actually a very fun book uh, in that Carson signed it, and that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a little note in it, which she signed too, where she uh, returned a dollar bill and thanked somebody for his comments. Um, presumably somebody she didn't know who mailed her a book with a dollar asking her to sign it and oh. send it back. Um, and, and Linda would know better than me, but uh, at least to me, it, it tells me what a, a thoughtful person Carson was, and, and what it really, and, and that comes across actually in your film too, in the interviews with Roger Christie, yeah. um, what a good person she was in addition to being a good environmentalist. Yeah. The DDC story is probably best covered, um, I think, in, in Linda's biography, Witness for Nature, uh, and some interesting things in there are uh, when she worked for Fish and Wildlife Service, a lot of studies were going on at, at places like Patuxent uh, Research Refuge on the effects of DDT, and, and uh, we have Carson actually writing about DDT uh, in press releases for the agency going back to 1945. So it had been a, a long-standing interest, and, and um, she was such a good um, synthesizer and absorber of everything that was happening in science around her, as, in addition to being a practitioner. This must uh, have stuck in her craw. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Be think about because it. she tried to get, uh, she tried to get Reader's Digest mm -hmm. to write a, to let her write a story about DDT in 1944, and they wouldn't do it. They turned her down cold because they were afraid of housewives' reaction to DDT and what how frightened they might yeah. might be. So they said no, and I think that stuck until we get more of this her writing in, in, as a, an employee and trying to get the, subtly get the message out. And uh, I, I'm convinced, although I have no evidence to back it up, it's because the Reader's Digest was selling so much of this crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the pages of Reader's right. Digest are That's full right. of and pesticide And they were worried about things. their, their and, advertisers. You know, it's all like flit. Uh, you know, this, is, this one's particularly interesting because it says, you know, Really, this is okay, but if you, uh, if you have a hotel, a restaurant, or a dairy, you ought to get our continuous flit sprayer so you can really douse everything. Just in constant, <laughs> an IV drip. In the <laughs> pesticide, but yeah. uh, yeah. there was a, it was, oh, it was very popular uh, mm -hmm. pesticide. And it's just, it, it, obviously, Carson was not just talking about DDT, but a whole um, Range. type of, of, of new chemical uh, toxin mm -hmm. in the environment. And uh, you're absolutely right, Linda. She... Um, She'd been interested in the issue a long mm -hmm. time. What made her finally make such a jump from, from marine biology books to, to what's really uh, a chemical book, an ethics book? Quite a, quite well, a change. I, th I think uh, 
sort of observing what was happening in Long Island, and again, we come back to birds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Carson's such an observer and such a lover of birds. And the fact that she was reading about uh, thinning eggshells and the fact that at Patuxent they had all these gallinaceous birds like eagles and, and pheasants uh, clearly having hormonal changes because they were being fed a diet of DDT. She felt that, that there were things that were going on that just simply needed to be spoken about. Then there was a trial in New York uh, court against uh, the aerial spraying of farmland. Carson learned about that, went up, followed the trial, got to be friends with Marjorie Spock, one of the key witnesses in that trial, and then got all the materials from that trial to take home and read. And from there, she, I think she was, she was gone. <laughs> she was gonna talk about, she was gonna talk about this. But I think it's important to note that she was not really just concerned about pesticides. Yeah. I think that was the example she used to bring the public focus. And I think one of the things we tried to do in our film is to show that she had a concern for the broader range of chemical contaminants in the biosphere and the mixture of things that you're exposed to that you don't sort out and experience one by one by one, the way our regulations are written. The toxic level of this is this right. much. But she said, you don't breathe one chemical at a time. You have all of them cumulatively. And she was very concerned about that. And I think that is something that we really need to pay attention to today. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, bioassay surveys are showing hundreds of synthetic chemicals in the bodies of every American, 79 of which are known to be mutagens and carcinogens, even into you know newborn infants. So I think her concerns were well-founded and her advice is still sound, that you know we need to focus on preventing the formation of these things, practicing green chemistry and designing things in a way that don't make them toxic to people as part of the design Well, I can criteria. go lead into Patty's book mm -hmm. here, into Mark's <laughs> film, because I think key to Carson's whole thinking is the atom bomb. Yes. Yeah. And the fact that she witnessed in 1945 that what she had never thought would ever happen, the potential destruction of the hu human planet, of the earth, of, of human life, of everything that she had ever known. She had denied for years that that was possible. We could never destroy what we loved or the planet. When the atom bomb happened, she realized that human nature was not going to stop with just this, and it was going to move on. And science became king. She was worried about that. She was worried about what the, what the end result, the end product, was going to be. And we see some of these end products right now that yeah. Patty's talking about. But it was, I think, that her, her desire to, to stop destroying nature in all its all the ways that humans can devise mm -hmm. to destroy nature that we're reaping right now and that that was what she was witnessing too. Absolutely. Hence the title. Right Hence now. the title. <laughs> <laughs> and it definitely, if I just said it's about DDT and, and chemical accumulation right. of a food chain, uh, it would do an injustice to what's really an environmental ethics mm -hmm. book and you're definitely. spot on. The, right. the, the, those of us that are older might recognize the references to Lucky Dragon and some of the right. great fallout horrors. Let me ask, uh, since I have Patty here who worked at the homestead in Chatham and we have um, Linda here who's Carson's biographer, there's been a lot written about um, the challenges she faced as a, as a woman in, in science and in and, and the federal government and, and so on. Um, what can you tell us a, about that? Because there's a lot of stuff out there, some of which um, is, is less substantiated than others. Did, did she face a lot of challenges? You start, Patty. But well, mm -hmm. I was a scientist. Um, I finished my doctorate in 1971, and I was one of, I think there were only 12 women in the program at the time I was there. And women, you know, really have a different course of their career uh, as recently as that. Um, I know I have male colleagues who finished at the same time I did, and they're deans of endowed <laughs> chairs and so forth, because they didn't take six years off to have two children in a <laughs> row. And you know, my academic career was going along very nicely. I had 17 peer-reviewed publications and you know, prestigious postdoc at Yale and Boston University. I had a daughter and I said, I brought her into the lab until she was three months old <laughs> and then you just can't, you know. And I thought, well, okay, I'll take a few months off and then pick it up again. 
And then I had a son on top of that, you know, very quickly. So it turned into three years. Well, you don't go back. You know, you don't go back. So you really had to choose between having a family and having a career. And my career was shaped by that decision to have a family. And I applied my training as a geneticist to environmental policy as a career choice. But Rachel didn't. Rachel didn't have those choices. I mean, if she had decided to have a family, she would not have been able to continue in a career as a scientist in that time, in her time. And it was hard enough for her to be accepted as a scientist in her time, in her place, even though she was hired as a scientist. And Linda, you've done the history of that better. Yeah, I, I think um, Carson worked because she had to support her family. Right. She uh, had a disastrous, you know, family basically, um, fa family life, and there was always one crisis after another, and there was very little money, and she needed that government job. But once she wrote the uh, the Sea Around Us, she became an international celebrity. She was um, became a member of the Great Arts Board. She was up for the National Book Award. Um, she became a, a literary celebrity, which is what she wanted. Yeah. Um, and then she got another uh, 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 fellowship to do The Edge of the Sea. Um, so she was off and running when she retired. I don't think she ever looked, looked back to wanting to be a scientist. Carson wanted to be a writer. She was mm -hmm. a writer. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, interviewing a lot of the people that are, I interviewed for this book, especially um, a gentleman who had written a book in the same year, but came out about six months before Carson's Silent Spring. Um, talking about pesticides, DDT, cosmetics, um, all kinds of uh, additives in food, etc. And it didn't go anywhere. And I interviewed him and he finally looked at me and he said, Linda, why didn't anybody read my book? Why is it all about the Carson, 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 Silent Spring? And I, I couldn't tell him. It's because nobody wrote like Rachel Carson. <laughs> Nobody. She had the misfortune of. Yeah. She had the misfortune of being so gifted, mm -hmm. literarily, that you couldn't put it down. Mm -hmm. And she could tell it, mm -hmm. and nobody else could. I think that's really the challenge that we have as scientists today to make the information not just available, but palatable yes. and attractive. Yeah. If she had started Silent Spring at the second chapter without the fable for tomorrow, right. She wouldn't have captured the imagination right. the way she did, and being able to connect to people, you know. And I think that's one of the ways film works today, that we don't have, you know, people reading books the way they read no. *Silent Spring*, but they will watch a film, they will watch a video, they will watch media. And I think that's why we felt we needed to go to film in order to carry this story forward in a rounder context because scientists in peer-reviewed journals today are no more popularly read than they were in the 52 right. pages of documentation in Silent Spring. You know, the peer-reviewed world is wonderful it's and marvelous. It's a very marvelous, small world. But it is, and you know, even within disciplines, it's in little narrow silos. You don't read across the synthesis of literature, mm -hmm. as you mentioned right. earlier, the way she did. And she pulled things from so many disciplines and was able to tell it as a story in a way that was compelling to people. And I think that's sadly in need today, really very sad. People ask me, uh, did, did Carson have uh, an interest in climate change? Um, did she believe that the seas were rising, et cetera, because oceans are her thing? Yeah, right. And of course she did. she did. And she does mention it, and she does talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's, it's in things like that Mark does that you can see a glacier disintegrating and melting and yeah. and kids can see that right. um, that's what that's where we should be we should be trying to tell people that story the way Carson told the sea around us story just briefly because I don't want to dwell on it too long but Carson uh, remains controversial there's websites right. up called Rachel was wrong and mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> And you I know, get hate mail. Yeah. <laughs> 52 years after the book mm -hmm. came out, right? So wh why do you think she remained such a polarizing figure, at least among some people? Um, my, in my uh, history with her, and uh, that goes back almost 20 years now, mm -hmm. um, it, 
it's because she's still seen as the baby killer. She was responsible for the U.S. and other countries follow suit to getting rid of DDT, which was life-saving against malaria. And now we've got malaria flare-ups and so forth and so on. So it's Rachel the baby killer. That's that's a lot of it, but a lot of that 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 goes only so far because that only reaches people who have no idea about insect tolerance and right. and um, the fact that once you've sprayed an agricultural country heavily with a, a cocktail of pesticides, insects aren't are going to be resistant anyway. Right. Um, and the fact is that Rachel never was against DDT. Right. Never, ever, ever. What did she advocate the end of DDT? She advocated. The, against the misuse of these chemicals. And it's the misuse that's the, the key underlying word. That's one reason. The other reason is her, her um, fight against uh, pesticides, organochemicals, phosphates, et cetera, uh, took on the big chemical companies of the, of the day. And they hated her. Um, so did the medical community. They were afraid she was going to destroy agriculture. That's why uh, Jager Hoover kept an FBI file on yes. her, because <laughs> yeah. she was suspect. She was a would-be right. communist. So there's a lot of right-wing political um, hatred mm -hmm. that is centered on Rachel Carson that isn't centered on these other advocates. And we've had we've had eloquent advocates right. for the environment okay. since Rachel, mm -hmm. but no one who could write like Rachel. So again, mm -hmm. it comes down to the she could write, she could get the word out, and therefore she's our target. Great. That's at least one, one answer. Well, and I, I think one thing that's changed since Patty described her career is, is Carson probably has helped bring a lot of women yes. into science. I think she's been a role model, yes. and as we mm -hmm. run out of time, um, I, I'd like each of you to, to let us know um, one thing you think from Rachel's legacy that would be useful for people to take. So if you had to take one aspect of a, a very rich, varied life and a, a, a complex personality. Are there any um, lessons or parts of her legacy that are worth remembering at, at, at the end of this very stimulating conversation? Well, if I go first, I get to say this. The yes. precaution <laughs> principle, protecting nature, learning from nature, living in harmony with nature's laws. The laws of nature are not negotiable. Nature will win. And she knew that. And she tried to convince us that we needed to follow the laws of nature instead of anything else. And love nature and protect it, and then we have a chance of surviving. That's a good one. How about I you, really, Mark? Yeah, I really liked, um, Roger said in one word, he said she was, Rachel was seeking to bring out a sense of balance. And, and I see balance also perhaps tempered with, an, uh, with this word we've passed around, some, this synthesis idea that I feel so many of our, our problems and challenges have been caused by the pursuit of certain technologies or outcomes at the expense of some externalities which were deemed okay at the time. And what we're learning is that there aren't a lot of externalities that are okay, either chemically or in people or in policy, that those things will come back and, and bite you in the butt at the end of the mm -hmm, day. It just mm -hmm. depends on you know, how long do you measure the end of the day? And how, how far is your away? And so I think the one lesson that I really take from Rachel Carson's example that I feel like we still have yet to learn deeply is this idea that we are, we are all interconnected in ways that we have yet to imagine. And that if we can really take that to heart, so many of our challenges and problems will be put into context that cause them to be solved very quickly. Great. Mm -hmm. Linda? And I would take the title of your film, your <laughs> wonderful film, The Power of One Voice. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, lots of mm -hmm. students, especially young people who do History Day projects, writing yes. to me mm -hmm. to say, um, talk about Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. That to me says um, one person can make a difference, one person who sticks to it, one person who has the courage to stand up and speak, mm -hmm. speak out. That's what Carson embodied, and that's what she, to me, um, gives us hope. Mm -hmm. That's what she would like mm -hmm. to be her legacy. If, yeah. if all of these one voices in her honor would speak together, what a chorus it would be. What a chorus. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a good way to go out. This has been yeah. remarkably stimulating. And as you. I was listening to all your comments, I, I realized what a wonderful and rare opportunity it is to have a historian and a writer, to have a filmmaker, to have a scientist, 
uh, all together uh, discussing the, the many aspects, uh, with the exception of filmmaker, all of which were encapsulated in Rachel's life. Yes. <laughs> she had a film made from one of her books, yeah. but we won't go there. It wasn't <laughs> so hot. Um, but it really was uh, illuminating. And uh, just to remind uh, folks out there that uh, Linda Lear's biography of Rachel Carson mm -hmm. is called Rachel Carson, Witness, Witness for Nature. Mm -hmm. Mark yeah. Dixon's hot off the press or hot <laughs> off the uh, <laughs> editing suite yep. uh, film is called The Power of One Voice. Mm -hmm. And My your book. title, which your book hasn't come out yet, yep. so you'll have to excuse me for not... Pathways to Our Sustainable Future. Pathways to Our Sustainable Future. It's an future. environmental ethic for the 21st century. It's based on Rachel Carson's environmental ethic. And we hope to see that in... The 2015 by University of Pittsburgh Press. Great. We'll bring it back when that, that book is complete. We'll talk about that. So. And Mark, we have to thank you yes. for your work in preserving <laughs> Rachel Carson's legacy here and mm -hmm. her extensive work in the, in the Fish and Wildlife Service. I know you continue to carry that battle forward. Well, we've, we thank you we've had a lot of assistance, it, yeah. and I, I have to just do one more shout out before I, I say yeah. goodbye. Uh, Linda, uh, when we were opening up this place and first um, thinking of uh, naming a lodge after Carson mm -hmm. and uh, having a conference on her has been remarkably Helpful. She set up oral yeah. histories with one yeah. of Rachel's colleague Shirley Briggs. Mm -hmm. She put us in touch with you oh, and, yeah, and other Carson. Well, you uh, carried the banner. There, you so yeah. we yeah. carried the banner really out here. Grateful yeah. to, Thank you. to all of you, and uh, we're very grateful to the audience for for tuning in. This was a really wonderful opportunity, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.